Come on. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was really delighted to be here and to see so many friends. Uh, the last time I was here was for Jacob's 65th birthday. So uh, that's been uh, only a couple of years ago, right, Jacob? So, <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I, you know, uh, as Shlomo mentioned, I, uh, my, my main um, sort of field has been information theory. And just as a plug, tomorrow I'm giving another talk, uh, more information theoretic in nature. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, the smart grid. And um, just by way of introduction, you know, I think uh, many of you know uh, this, but uh, in, in recent years there's been a lot of interest in uh, taking the, uh, what I would call the physical layer of the electricity grid and imposing on top of that uh, a, a cyber layer of sensors, uh, controls, and communication networks in order to make the grid more efficient, uh, to allow uh, control to be distributed out to the end users, okay, uh, and also to incorporate renewable sources of energy, and also um, to incorporate more storage at the at the ends of the network, the, le the leaves of the grid, if you might, if you would say. So, because this uh, because of this cyber layer, there's a lot of uh, overlap in terms of uh, sort of structure with uh, wireless networks, which has been uh, an interest of mine for many years. And so a lot of the same ideas that have been applied in wireless networking uh, also have a role in smart grid, or potential role in smart grid. So what I'm going to talk about today is, sort of is, is that, looking at things uh, which have come up in, in my work and others' work in wireless networking and how they might be applied to, to electricity grids. So just as a um, uh, sort of a disclaimer, you know, I'm not a power systems person. I, what I don't know about power systems is vast. So my perspective here is really that of a person from another field who's looking for uh, ways to make uh, contributions to energy systems through uh, some of the things that have been applied elsewhere. So it's a little bit like a, a situation where the physical layer is being abstracted uh, just like in communication systems, the physical layer is being abstracted, perhaps beyond recognition to those in the field, but it, at a point to a point that allows uh, uh, consideration of some analytical techniques that might prove useful in trying to understand solutions for the grid. So with that introduction, let me just say a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about three things, uh, all of them fairly briefly. The first one is uh, game theoretic methods for modeling the interactions among uh, uh, nodes on the, and the grid. And here I'm mainly going to talk about storage nodes. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of privacy. And I'll start by talking about a general formalism for privacy uh, in, of, of data sources in general. And then I'll talk about a couple of examples uh, of applying these ideas in smart grid. Uh, this is work is, pr this formalism is primarily information theoretic. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk just briefly about uh, distributed algorithms for state estimation. Uh, and so here, this is uh, basically using some ideas from statistical inference in um, these problems. And, and e even though distributed state estimation is not a new problem, there are some uh, new, idea new, new issues here that make it an interesting problem again in this context. So let me, let me just get started right away so that I don't run over my three hours. Um, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, and so I, I'll try to go through these things fairly briefly. Let me just say, Yoav mentioned that the audience here might be quite broad. And I know some of the, uh, the, the um, concepts I'm going to discuss here might not be as familiar to everyone. So I'll, I'll try to, when, when I come across something like that, I'll try to do a little bit of a side uh, explanation of those things to make it uh, as clear as possible. So the first thing I want to talk about is game, using game theoretic methods for modeling the interactions among uh, the participants in the grid. And what I'm going to talk about here is mostly joint work with Walid Saad, who's a former postdoc of mine now at the University of Miami. Uh, 
So just by way of motivation, uh, I'll just say a couple things about uh, the, the grid as a, uh, as a network. First of all, it's very heterogeneous. There are many different types of nodes, electric vehicles, smart meters, uh, substations, sensors, all kinds of things, other kinds of loads. Uh, and each node has its own objectives, so it's not one unified, there's not one unified objective uh, of all the participants in the, in the grid. Also, it's very large scale. There are potentially millions of nodes in the grid, in a typical grid. Uh, and it's dynamic. There are, uh, every, things are varying uh, in time due to demand, also even possibly due to mobility if you have electric vehicles. And so it's a dynamic uh, system. So in, in short, it's a lot like an economic system. And of course, we know that game theory is uh, very good at trying to at describing the behavior of participants in an economic system. So it's also useful for uh, describing behavior in the grid. We need, because it basically captures uh, the uh, behavior of individuals, uh, each of whom is working in his or her own behalf. So there, so game theory, as I said, is a useful framework here, and there are two branches of game theory. There's non-cooperative game theory where, or competitive game theory, where all the players are competing with one another for selfishly. Uh, and then there's cooperative game theory where players work together to achieve some common goal. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm not going to do a lot of, there's not a lot of depth in what I'm going to talk about, but I just want to give you some ideas about how these ideas can be applied in Smart Grid. And I'll do that through some examples. <coughs> okay, so the first example I want to use is the problem of energy trading uh, for plug-in vehicles. So I think everybody knows that the number of plug-in vehicles, either hybrids or electric vehicles is increasing dramatically, uh, and the idea is that in the future there'll be many, many more of these. So for that reason, there's going to be a lot of storage at the ends of the grid, uh, and you might think of a situation, and there are actually already some test beds like this, where groups of vehicles can uh, work together to trade energy with the grid. Okay, so you might think of a situation where people drive to work in the morning, uh, in their electric vehicles, they plug them into the grid, they have surplus energy in them, and they can, so they're energy sources in themselves, and they can either sell to the grid or maybe buy from the grid depending on the economics of the situation. So energy trading with electric vehicle groups is a, a potential thing of the future for electricity grids. So one way to, uh, to model the interactions among such groups is to use non-cooperative game theory. And there, there are two ways to do that. So we can think about a uh, situation here where we have multiple electric vehicle groups. They're, there's no reason why they should coordinate with one another. They're actually competitors. But they're going to interact with the same grid. And depending on how the grid acts, it can, we can think of two different kinds of game theory. One is if the grid is a single entity, so the, if the grid is just a power company, then it's a single entity, and we can think about a game type of game, a leader-follower game, where the, the grid acts as a leader in setting a price for energy, and the electric vehicle groups act as followers, that is, once a price has been set, they compete with one another in that market. It's called a Stackelberg game. Uh, another, uh, if the grid elements themselves are autonomous, that is, if there are a lot of different potential sellers or buyers in the grid, then um, we can think of a, a different situation where we still have a competitive game among the electric vehicle groups, but the, interac the economic interaction with the, between the electric vehicle groups and the main grid uh, is, is more of a multi-party problem, uh, which could be modeled better as an auction. Okay, so I'm going to just give, talk a little bit about each one of these, and I'll start with the second one. Okay. So suppose we have a situation where the electric vehicle groups are selling into the main grid, and the main grid uh, consists of multiple parties who are trying to buy energy from those uh, gr uh, uh, electric vehicle groups. All right, so uh, first of all, we have to model the market. And since we have multiple buyers and multiple sellers, a reasonable way to do that is as a double auction. So we can order the buyers, that is, the elements in the main grid, uh, in terms of the value of their, their bids in a decreasing order, 
bids for electricity to be bought from the electric vehicle groups. And we can order the sellers, that is the elect electric vehicle groups, uh, in order of increasing prices. And so that gives us a supply and demand curve. And the, where they cross will be the, the price that's set by the auction. It'll also determine who are sellers and who are buyers. Uh, so uh, we'll basically see that uh, by running this auction, we'll, we have a price uh, determined for that particular de demand supply uh, uh, profile. Uh, and the trading price is just basically going to be the, 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 the average price right at the intersection. Okay. So the average price, uh, uh, the price is going to depend on uh, many factors, of course, but in particular it's going to depend on the supply. And the supply is, the, is what the electric vehicle groups can control. That is, they can decide how much energy to sell into the, into the market. So uh, we can think of a vector A, uh, the ith element of which is the amount of energy put up for sale by the ith electric vehicle group. Okay, so what's going to happen now is that the electric vehicle groups, uh, once a price is set, they'll start playing a game to decide what A to play, uh, a competitive game to decide what uh, elements to, to use for A. Uh, and as they do that, uh, the, the curve here will shift. So the, the uh, intersection of supply and demand will start changing as the game is being played. Okay, so I'll say more about that in a second. Okay, so each electric vehicle group is going to uh, decide how much, uh, on its own, autonomously and in a competitive manner, how much energy to sell into the market uh, at once the price has been set at a given inst time instant. Incidentally, this is joint work with uh, Walid. I mentioned this is Xu Han, this is Tamara Bashar, and this work appears in a paper that's been submitted to the IEEE transactions on Smart Grid. Um, so in order to, to make decisions about how much energy to sell, each uh, vehicle group has to have a, a utility function so just like in economics. And here uh, we can model utility in terms of a, a bilinear term, in terms of price and quantity sold, which is just essentially the revenue that the ith group is going to get, minus a penalty term. And here the penalty term is quadratic. It doesn't have to be, but it just comes from the literature. Uh, a, a penalty term that uh, accounts for the fact that the energy in the battery is in fact useful later because the the vehicles in the group have to drive home at night, so they can't sell all their energy into the, into the marketplace during the daytime. So, uh, so there's a penalty term, so it's a linear quadratic uh, penalty uh, for w if you fix all of the, if for, for uh, vehicle group I, if you fix the uh, amount sold by the other groups, uh, then it's easy to maximize this utility. Uh, and so uh, that's how the game is played. Now, n normally when you're trying to solve a game theoretic problem, you like to find an analytical equilibrium. That is a point where none of the, uh, so a Nash equilibrium is a point where none of the players can uh, better itself by changing its strategy. That's the kind of uh, solution we're looking for here. Uh, and normally you'd like to find an analytical solution or an analytical characterization of the Nash equilibrium. But here, uh, because the auction is in involved, uh, in, in the middle of the decision making, there are discontinuities that make it very difficult to uh, solve this problem analytically. But we can algorithmically examine this by letting the users uh, or the, the players uh, uh, or, or compete using so-called best response, where uh, one player plays um, by maximizing its own utility, then the, uh, as I said before, the demand supply uh, curve shifts, uh, a new price is determined, uh, then the next player plays uh, to maximize its own utility and so forth, and you keep going like that until you come to some kind of equilibrium. And if you play that game, uh, this is the kind of result that you get. So what show, what's shown here uh, is a simulation where the, there uh, something like uh, each electric vehicle group has a, something like three or four hundred vehicles in it. There are some parameters, which are the parameters of electric vehicles, in this case, Teslas, 
Uh, and you can look at what happens when the when this how, how to model the interaction of the users when um, th they're playing this game versus the situation where uh, they just uh, greedily sell all their energy into the market at whatever the auction price is. And so what's shown here is versus the number of groups that are in the market, the average utility per group. So the utility is this price that I showed, or this uh, adjusted revenue that I showed. And you can see that uh, in the blue, the blue curve shows the utility uh, for this at the equilibrium of this game. And the red curve shows the equilibrium, equilibrium uh, the uh, average utility for the greedy algorithm where everyone just sells greedily into the marketplace. And you can see that the game theoretic behavior leads to a much higher utility on average for, all, for everyone. Okay. Uh, now, of course, as the number of sellers goes up, the average utility goes down. This is just basic economics. Uh, but on the other hand, there's still a sizable gap, no matter where you are in terms of the number of vehicle groups here, between uh, sort of greedy selling back into the, the grid and um, uh, playing this game, this competitive game, with this particular utility. Now, we can also look at the situation where uh, the grid acts as a single entity. And remember there, uh, we don't need to have an auction because the, the single entity can act as a leader by setting a price. So if the grid is the power company, it can just set a price. Uh, and of course, that price has to be iterated on as the, so that the, 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 the leader sets a price or a strat its own strategy. Then the followers play a game to decide on their strategies, which again are, in this case, I'm looking at, I'm going to look at buying, but how much energy to buy, uh, and then the leader can adjust its price and so forth until it comes to an equilibrium. So here, uh, that's the way we play the game. We can, we can continue with utilities uh, that are still linear quadratic for the vehicle groups. Uh, and here, again, these are, they're buying in this particular case, but it's a similar situation, sort of a duel to the other problem. Uh, and the price is set by the leader. And the leader's utility will be bilinear, that it all it cares about is the price times the total quantity sold. So this is a very clean game analytically, and we can actually solve for, th there, it leads to a Stackelberg equilibrium, meaning an equilibrium where everyone is satisfied with where they are, doesn't want to change their uh, decision or their action. Uh, and this can be uh, determined in closed form analytically, because we don't have this nonlinearity of the auction. Uh, so we can just look at that very briefly. These are uh, simulation results based on that. Uh, actually, these are, these are computations based on that. Uh, and this is the, uh, what's shown here is the, the equilibrium price versus the number of electric vehicle groups. And what's shown here is the average utility per group versus the number of groups. Uh, and you can see, as you would expect, as there are more buyers, uh, the price goes up. Uh, and the different, the different curves here uh, show um, different amounts of total supply. So the red curve is the maximum total supply, and the, the dotted black curve is the least total supply. And of course, the supply and demand is operating there. Uh, on the right, you can see the average utility versus uh, uh, electric vehicle group. It goes down as there are more buyers. They have to pay more for the energy that's there. Uh, but this is also compared with some other schemes, which are, which are known in the literature for determining this. And, uh, but you can see basically the same trend, that um, this uh, scheme allows us to get gain over other, other schemes. <coughs> uh, so let me, again, I don't want to take too much time on these examples, but let me just look, uh, mention another example in which we, we can look at a cooperative game to describe the behavior of uh, elements in an energy network. Uh, and that's the problem of energy trading within the distribution network. So you have, in the power system, you have a trans transmission network, which is the high, high voltage stuff. And then the distribution network, which is the local neighborhood uh, or the local area where the voltages are lower and where all the loads are, or at least loads like uh, the ones that we would have. So we can think of the elements in that distribution network as microgrid elements, that is, elements such as solar arrays, wind farms, loads of various sorts, uh, electric vehicles, 
things of that sort, uh, homes. Uh, and the normal way of uh, behavior of microgrid elements is to interact directly with the transmission grid. That is, e if you look at the distribution grid, each microgrid element is interacting, interacting directly, uh, buying and selling energy directly with the, with the macro grid. Okay. But uh, another thing that could be done here is that the gr microgrid elements could exchange energy among themselves. That is, rather than trading with a macro grid, they could trade with each other, uh, either sell surplus if they're a uh, solar array or a wind farm, or, or they could buy from these people if they're uh, a load. Okay? So there can be advantages to doing that. One could be some kind of pricing structure. Another might be to think about trying to reduce power losses over transmission lines. Okay. Whatever, you can see that there should be some advantage to trading down the distribution network rather than always trading with the uh, uh, transmission network. And so this is a, an opportunity to look at the application of um, cooperative games to a problem in smart grid. And in particular, a type of cooperative game that's, that is quite useful in this kind of situation is a, is a coalition game. So what I want to look at now is just again briefly applying coalition games to uh, this kind of setting where we have microgrids uh, and it should be advantageous for them to cooperate in some way. And this gives us a model for how that can happen. All right, so let me, let me back up now and talk a little bit about what a coalition game is. Uh, coalition game uh, consists of a set of players, N, uh, and a utility or value function, V. And the players are grouped into coalitions. So the coalition is just a subset of the set of users. Uh, and, and these are the coalitions of group of users that cooperate with one another. Okay, so for a coalition S, uh, we'd like to be able to assign a value. So the value function is just a set function that assigns values to coalitions. And then within a coalition, we need to apportion the value out to the players in the coalition, and we do that through a payoff function. So each player I in a coalition S will receive some part of the value as a payoff for being part of the coalition. So we can, given a payoff, a, a, a payoff vector for a coalition, then we can start ordering coalitions based on some ordering. And a natural ordering in this situation is the Pareto ordering, where uh, one coalition is better than another if uh, at least one uh, of the uh, elements of the new coalition is better off than in the old coalition, and none of them is worse off. So it's a social optimality. Uh, and then we can, once we have an ordering, we can start iterating on coalitions. And one way to do that is to do merges and splits. That is, start out with some basic coalitions, or maybe all singletons, start merging, looking to see whether merging adds, uh, in increases the Pareto value of a coalition. If it does, you keep it. If it doesn't, you, you don't keep it. You can split coalitions and so forth. And if you do merges and splits, uh, you can always converge to a stable merge and split proof limit. Okay, so again, nothing analytical here. It's all pretty much uh, based on algorithmic iteration toward uh, a limit, merge and split proof limit. So to apply that here, we need to de describe the value function. So to do that, we have, suppose we have a coalition of microgrid elements. We can divide them into sellers and buyers within a particular, within a coalition. We can order the buyers, so we take an ordering pi over the buyers. And then we take the buyers in order, uh, allow them to buy as much energy as they need from other partners in the coalition uh, until all the um, power that's available within the coalition has been exhausted, at which point the coalition has to buy energy from the macro grid. Or uh, if there's surplus energy left over after all this, the buyers have been satisfied, then uh, the surplus energy is sold into the macro grid. All right, so uh, we need a utility function. We could, we could, as I said, we could apply price. We could apply other things. But one way to look at this is to look at power loss. So we can, we can look at, for a given ordering pi and uh, a given coalition S, we can let the utility be 
the negative of the power loss in exchanging energy among the various parties. So there's power loss, losses associated with uh, trading energy within the coalition, that's his first term. There are power losses associated with selling uh, energy into the macro grid if there's a surplus. And there are power losses associated with buying energy from the macro grid if there's uh, a deficit. Okay, so this gives us uh, everything we need. Uh, almost, we have a way of assigning value to uh, coalitions, uh, but to get a single value function, we need to find the maximum over all possible ordering. So the, the coalition game we want to play here is to uh, choose a coalition and, and assign value in this way. We have uh, maximizing over all orderings uh, of all uh, of the buyers in the coalition this particular utility. All right. Then uh, we want to apportion that to the users. And again, just very briefly, one way to do that is by uh, proportion, giving each user, uh, each member of the coalition, a proportion of the value proportionate to how much it contributes to that value. So uh, each, each unit, uh, in each uh, player in the coalition could trade energy directly with the uh, main grid. Uh, and if we look at the total cost of that, uh, that's this term here. This is just th looking at the value of each singleton. Uh, and, if, and the value, of the, the net value of the coalition is the difference between the value of the coalition and the amount that it would cost to uh, trade energy um, and, and the utility of trading energy directly with the main grid. Okay, and then the fraction of that contributed by element I uh, is basically given by alpha i. So this particular assignment of value um, apportions the, the total value out to the elements of the grid or the participants in the coalition uh, proportionate to the value that they add to the coalition. Okay, and that's a long-winded way to say a simple idea. Okay, so we can, we have everything we need to apply, I mean we have models for uh, just back up, there are, there, there, there are well-known models for these terms here, uh, the loss terms based on various factors in the microgrid, uh, in, the, in the distribution network, uh, micro, where the microgrids are. And so we can now run merges and splits. This is an example, the single run of uh, a simulation run where we have in a 10 uh, by 10 kilometer square, we have 10 microgrid elements of various sorts. Some are sources and some are sinks. Uh, and you can see that uh, when we run this uh, algorithm, we do reach uh, coalitions. That is, we don't wind up with the grand coalition of all um, of the microgrid elements in one coalition. They don't act as singletons, but in fact, they do form coalitions with one another, uh, coalitions among themselves. And because we're looking at power losses, the coalitions are geographical, basically, as you can see. This is the, the macro station, so this is where uh, energy trading with the main grid takes place, which is why you can see the, these coalitions forming in this way. And we can look at the average uh, cost, uh, or in this case power loss, uh, per microgrid element versus the number of microgrid elements in many runs of this kind of merge and split uh, uh, iteration. Uh, that's the red line shown here. And this is compared with the class, what it's called, I'm calling the classical non-cooperative scheme, which is the situation where all the microgrid elements just change, exchange energy directly with the main grid. And you can see that the, the losses are, uh, uh, the, the savings is much, is very significant. And particularly as you have more microgrid elements, um, the, uh, uh, of course, they're, they're, more, they're more densely packed, and so the losses are just going to go down as they exchange energy with one another. Whereas if they continue to change energy, exchange energy directly with the macro grid, uh, having more uh, elements doesn't really help much in terms of saving on transmission losses. All right, so uh, I want to have plenty of time for the other two topics, so let me just wrap this up. First of all, so what, here I just talked about game theory uh, for modeling of smart grid interactions. Uh, I looked at this problem of demand side management, uh, that is energy trading. Uh, and markets of that sort. Uh, we also, I also looked at this problem of using cooperative games for looking at the operation of microgrids. 
Uh, and I'll just mention a paper here, which is again with Walid, Chu, and Tamer, which appeared in the Signal Processing Magazine in September, uh, which describes these techniques and others uh, in applying game theory in the smart grid. Uh, I'll mention a couple of other interesting problems. One is uh, sort of a classical problem in communication, which is network, a network formation game, where you use game theory to help form, uh, form a network in a competitive network, uh, where nodes are trying, a competitive communication network, where nodes are trying to uh, backhaul data through common um, transmission lines, uh, and so they have to compete for the capacity of those lines. And this paper, which appeared in Game Nets in uh, 2011, uh, basically we look at this problem where the backhaul is power line communications, which is, has, has very high bandwidth over short distance, but narrow bandwidth over long distances. Uh, so you need multi-hop uh, backhaul. Uh, and so this gives rise to a game where the, uh, the users have to compete for the, uh, the legs of the multi-hop network. There's a network formation game here. It's a competitive game, Nash game. Uh, and the, here we use the utility function is the delay, or the negative of delay, and you can do some things there. Uh, we can also look at this uh, sort of more complicated markets with the, the um, Stackelberg games, where we look, try to enforce social optimality on the network, uh, on the grid, uh, with a, with a um, uh, uh, using a Stackelberg strategy. Okay? This is a paper, by the way, that was just presented at the ICC in Budapest this week. Uh, more generally, you know, this is a problem uh, where there are multiple layers to look at. There's the physical layer of the electricity grid. There's a cyber layer that I mentioned. There's also an economic layer, uh, which also adds another interesting dimension to these kinds of problems. And there's also a political layer. And, and energy distribution, of course, is a regulated industry. So there's a political layer, and I think there's a lot of interesting uh, things that can be examined here in terms of game theory. I mean, classically, of course, economics is studied through game theory, so there are many, I think, other things that could be examined here. Also, looking at dynamic games, which hasn't been looked at at all in this context, is another sort of interesting, leads to another interesting class of problems. All right, well, I want to move on now and talk about some other things. So uh, let, me, let me now talk about the second problem, which is, has to do with the problem of privacy. And I want to talk mainly about uh, privacy, a general formalism for privacy in data sources. Uh, and then I'll give examples in Smart Grid, so you'll see how this relates. Uh, and this is joint work with Lalitha Shankar, who's another former postdoc of mine who's now at uh, Arizona State. So the basic motivation for this is that, you know, as we know, there are many uh, electronic data repositories there out in the, the web uh, that have information about us, some of which is private. Okay, so obviously Google and Facebook things like that, but also smart in the electricity grid, smart meters generate private information about customers, and this is all out there also in cyberspace somewhere. Now the reason this data exists, of course, is because it's useful, and the utility of data depends on its accessibility. So um, on, the other, on the other hand, uh, the existence of this data there can also means that private information can also be leaked. Okay, so there's a trade off, inherent trade off between the accessibility of data to, to give it utility uh, and the lack of accessibility of data to keep it private. Okay, so there's a fundamental trade off that rises in data repositories between privacy and utility. So I want to talk about a formalism for that first, in general, and then I'll talk about smart grid. Okay, so first of all, we can th think about modeling a data source as a database, and a database is simply a table. So we have uh, rows that are entries, so individuals whose data is stored in the database are rows, uh, and columns are attributes of those entries. So for example, in a medical database, you might have uh, an entry would be a person or a visit, a patient visit, and then the attributes would be demographic data, when the visit took place, what tests were done, what uh, the results were, what diagnoses were determined, what medications were uh, uh, 
uh, prescribed and so forth. And of course the way a database works is somebody queries the database and the database returns a response. So we can model, mathematically we can model that situation as a set of vectors. Uh, we can think of the rows as being independent and identically distributed from one another. Uh, and, but, but the columns, of course, uh, would not be independent. This is how privacy can leak in a database. So we can think about the, um, the mathematical, mathematically we can think about a database as a set of in independent and identically distributed observations from some random vector uh, with a general joint distribution. Okay, and then the attributes, which are the, the elements of this, that this distri joint distribution is describing, uh, can be divided into two types, public ones and private ones. Okay, so the public ones are ones we'd like to reveal, and the private ones are ones we'd like to keep hidden. So, for example, in a medical database, you might want to reveal uh, the test results and the diagnoses and the treatments for research purposes, but you'd like to keep private the demographics or certainly the in identity of the individual who's being, who, individuals who are, whose data is being uh, contained in that database. So we have the two types of variables, and ideally we'd like to keep the public ones, reveal the public ones and keep the private ones hidden, but uh, first of all, there may be overlap between these two. Uh, for example, in a financial database, your, your credit card information might be, the full credit card number might be private, but the last four digits might be public. Or your social security number in the US the whole thing is private, but the last three, four digits might be public. Okay, uh, or even if they're not, there's not overlap here though, because the attributes are correlated with one another. Um, there could be leakage of of the private data through revealing the public data. Okay, so the problem, wh what we'd like to look at is how we can maximally reveal the public data, uh, and sort of at the same time keeping the private data as private as possible. Or more, pr more, pro more properly, we'd like to look at the trade-off between revealing the public data and keeping the private data private. <laughs> All right, so let me just uh, contrast this problem with the secrecy problem. In the secrecy problem, or the communication secrecy problem, we have a single source and multiple receivers. So we have, say we have an information source that we'd like to send to a particular receiver an intended receiver, uh, and there, there, there's a potential eavesdropper listening in on the conversation. So what, in the secrecy problem, what we'd like to do is take a single source, deliver it to one legitimate receiver reliably, and keep it secret from another uh, eavesdropping receiver. On the other hand, in the privacy problem, we really have only one receiver. That is, the query, uh, even though, of course, there are secrecy issues in in, in database, in securing databases from eavesdroppers, there's also a more fundamental issue, which is that the users, the legitimate users of the database, are also people from whom some of the data should be kept secret. Okay, so in the privacy problem, we really just have a single receiver, which is the query initiator, and the dichotomy comes into the source. That is, we have public and private variables in the source. Uh, so it's a, so it's a different, philosophically, a different problem. So now, how can we, given this setting, how can we characterize this trade-off? So, uh, first of all, we can measure utility by distortion, or in an inverse way by distortion. So we can we can look at the utility of of a database uh, in terms of the distortion that uh, a querier sees in the public variables as rece as re as revealed to the user. Okay, so small distortion means high utility. On the other hand, we can measure privacy in terms of equivocation on the private variables and information revealed to a user. So equivocation uh, is an information theoretic term. This just means the entropy of the variables conditioned on observations given to the, uh, the user. And the higher that entropy is, the less informative uh, those observations are about the uh, private variables. So we'd like to have small distortion of the public variables and high equivocation of the private variables. So what we'd like to do is to find the region of possible di le distortion levels and equivocation levels 
that we can get for a given database model, that is for a given set of independent identically distributed vectors from a given distribution. Okay, so mathematically that defines the problem, and now what we'd like to do is to figure out how to determine this region for a given problem. Okay, so to do that, we can map this into a communications problem. We can think about the action of the, the uh, database in revealing data as being a type of encoding. That is, the database, which again is just a, a set of n vectors from a given distribution, uh, can be quantized into a, set, a finite set of data, potential databases called sanitized databases. So this, this comes from the computer science, this term comes from the computer science literature on database privacy. So by distorting the database, that is quantizing it in some way, you're, you're hiding some of the information in the database. So we can think about uh, a, set, a finite set of databases, so this is basically an encoding. Uh, so we have now a communications problem. We have a source which has two types of variables, hidden and revealed. The encoder is mapping that source into one of a set of quantization, quantized databases. That's, re that's what's revealed to the querier, which is a decoder here. And its job is to reconstruct the reveal variables as well as, as, well as it can based on uh, this reveal database. So we'll measure the utility of that reconstruction in terms of the distortion. So uh, we'd like to look, we can propose some distortion metric rho, which measures the difference between the reconstructed reveal variables and the actual reveal variables. We'd like to make that small, or we'd like to make that at least less than or equal to some amount d plus epsilon, where epsilon is something that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And that characterizes the utility of the database. Uh, on the other hand, we'd like to uh, be sure that the equivocation, that is the entropy of the hidden variables given what's revealed here, is greater than some amount e minus a term that's going to go to zero as the size of the database goes to infinity. So what we'd like to do is determine the possible values of d and e, that is the ones that can be achieved by various uh, encodings here. To do that efficiently, we'd like to introduce a third quantity, which really doesn't have much to do with this problem, but which makes it the solution easier, and that's a rate constraint. That is, we'd like to put a bound on the number of sanitized databases in the, that we can quantize to. And we can characterize that in terms of a rate, r, which is just the number of bits revealed per entry in the database per query. Okay, so now we have three quantities, rate, distortion, equivocation. And this puts this problem in the framework of a, tr of a classical problem in information theory. That is, rate distortion problem is one of the most classical problems of information theory, trading off rate for distortion. And now we have an additional, additional quantity, which is equivocation. So this is a rate distortion problem with an equivocation constraint, which is a problem that was posed by Yamamoto in the 1980s. Okay? So this is a problem with a known provenance. We can, although Yamamoto's problem was a simpler one than this, we can apply some machinery from information theory to start solving these problems. And basically, we can, if we can solve the rate distortion equivocation problem, we can easily solve the equivocation distortion problem, which is the utility privacy trade-off. So if we, if we look at a particular feasible distortion equivocation point, uh, the rate associated with that is just going to be a value above which, any, any rate above which, uh, we can achieve that pair okay, of distortion equivocation. So the rate, uh, the rate distortion equivocation region is really uh, a, a solid uh, with a lower bound, which is a surface given something like this. The projection of that surface onto the distortion, the distortion rate plane is the classical rate distortion function. And the projection down into the dis distortion equivocation plane is the, the region that we want here, okay, which is the trade gives us the trade-off between distortion and equivocation, or equivalently between utility and privacy. And in particular, the the outer bound of that region is the efficient frontier. That is, we can move along this boundary, and that tells us the optimal trade-off for a given level of distortion, how much equivocation we have to give up. So for, or for a given level of utility, how much privacy do we have to sacrifice? 
Okay. All right, so that's the general formalism, and let me just briefly mention two applications uh, to the electricity grid. One is competitive privacy. So this is a, a slight uh, generalization of that problem, where now we have multiple parties who have data that they need to share in order to do, to, to do some common good. Okay? So one, one problem comes up, like this comes up, uh, for example, in the North American electricity grid, which is divided up into these so-called regional transmission organization, uh, and they have to manage the grid together. So this PJM is where I live in New Jersey. This manages Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, and they have to share information in order to understand what's happening in the electricity grid more generally. One way to think about that is they need to do state estimation of the grid in order to have reliability of the decisions they're making. This is the utility that they get from sharing information. On the other hand, uh, there are competitors in the marketplace, so they'd like to withhold information uh, for e reasons of economic competitiveness, and that's where privacy comes in. So here we have a utility privacy trade-off, but we have multiple players, so this gives rise to a problem of competitive privacy. So we can model that mathematically by uh, in this way, we can think about the measurements at a given regional transmission organization, say the Kth one, as being the superposition of measurements uh, of states of all the RTOs. Uh, so this is a linear superposition plus noise. Okay, so this looks uh, a little bit like a multiple access channel to some of us. Uh, and we can then measure utility for a given RTO in terms of the mean squared error in reconstructing its own state. And we can measure privacy uh, for its, very, its uh, measurements in terms of the leakage of information about its state to the other RTOs. Okay, so this defines the problem that we want. And it turns out that Jacob solved this problem many years ago. Uh, it turns out that weiner ziv coding gives you the efficient frontier in trading off these two things. As you would, I think if you're familiar with this problem, I think you would realize that because now we have a very familiar problem in information theory, which is tra trading off mean square reconstruction error, basically with rate of transmission, okay, in a multi-user setting. Uh, another problem we can talk about here is in smart metering, okay. Now, smart metering is a, is a situation where uh, you have a meter on your home or premises that gives data about usage uh, on a re almost real-time basis. Okay, back to the power company. So uh, if you look at a smart meter, it's producing measurements of, of usage in real time, basically. Now, smart meter data is useful because it allows the power company to balance load. It allows for uh, price aware usage. That is, you can decide uh, how much to use. It also can allow us for much more rapid pricing uh, decisions at the, at, for the power company and so forth. So there's a lot of utility in knowing this kind of data for both parties. On the other hand, smart meters can leak information about what's happening in the home. So you, this is a tip, this is a cartoon, but it, if you look at these traces, they look a lot like this. Uh, if, you, if you turn on your toaster, there's a particular signature that can be detected uh, at the meter. Uh, if you turn on the tea kettle, there's a signature the oven, you can tell what's happening in the house or you can tell if nothing's happening in the house by looking at the smart meter. So there's a utility privacy trade-off here in terms of revealing smart meter data. And uh, this, this takes a little bit more uh, work because this is now a time series problem, but we can also formulate, formulate this problem in a similar way. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the solution uh, to this problem, that is, the way you get the, maximum, the optimal trade-off between utility and privacy here uh, is to use a so-called reverse water filling uh, distortion on the smart meter data. That is, uh, if you look at the, spec the power spectrum of the smart meter data, uh, then those uh, uh, components that are, have low uh, power, you suppress, uh, and then the others you just let you transmit as they are. And the the intuition here is that the most informative things uh, that happen are those sort of transient things, which have the lowest power overall. Uh, they're the most revealing, but probably the least useful. 
So if you suppress those kinds of activities out of the data, then you're, you're sort of max, getting maximum utility for tra uh, as traded off with privacy. Okay. Now you can also add uh, to this uh, energy storage uh, and also use that as a control to control what's coming out as well. And there's a, we had a paper on this. Uh, it's about to come out in the JSAC Smart Grid series, I think, I think next month. All right, so just to wrap this up, and then I see that I'm really using the time, so I'll be very quick in the last one. I only have a couple slides there. So here we, we looked at this general formalism for private and public uh, tra trading off privacy and utility of, of a database which has private and public variables. This leads to this equivocation distortion characterization. We added rate to get a problem that we could solve. Uh, we looked at two applications in smart grid, competitive privacy and smart metering. Uh, we can also consider other things, which I, I won't talk about here today, but we can also look at multiple queries, that is, multiple queries to the same database, which gives a different uh, set of privacy utility trade-off issues. This is a problem of success to disclosure. We can also look at multiple sources, that is, multiple databases with, the with common entries. This gives us a problem of, uh, this adds the issue of site information, which we can also characterize. So there, there are a lot of things in this uh, formalism that I won't talk about today. Okay, now in the one minute remaining, uh, let me talk, let me do what I can uh, very quickly with this last problem of distributed algorithms for state estimation. Uh, and this problem is a joint problem with, a joint, this is joint work with Le Xie, who's uh, not a former postdoc of mine, but a, a professor at uh, Texas A&M, working in power systems. <clears throat> so let me just very briefly motivate this. So the idea here, the problem here is that we have uh, in, in the smart grid, uh, one of the issues to confront is, the, is that of big data. That is, there are many sensors, uh, new types of sensors which sa sample very rapidly, so-called phasor measurement units. There are smart meters, so there's a lot of data in the grid that has to either be backhauled to some central point or uh, which is going to create communication bottlenecks or handled uh, in a distributed fashion. Okay, so this means that it's interesting to look at the problem of state estimation, which is important for situational awareness, in a distributed setting. Okay, we'd like to distribute state estimation out to uh, RTOs, or which I'm going to call control areas here, uh, in order to allow them to hopefully estimate system-wide states without um, having to backhaul all the data to a single point. Now this, is not, this kind of problem is not new. Uh, distributed state estimation is an old problem, but an interesting twist here is that in this problem there are really two types of distribution. There's, there are two networks. There's a power grid, which is a physical, which has a network of physical connections. And then there's a cyber grid network, which is the communication network over which we can exchange data. And those, aren't necessarily, those don't necessarily have the same topology. So we have two different kinds of networks that we're dealing with, and that, uh, so the, the network that we're trying to estimate has one topology, and the network in which the data is distributed has another topology. So that gives this problem of distributed state estimation a new twist. So with that, let me just very briefly give you a flavor of what, what we've done here. So first of all, we can use a DC model for the system state, that is the grid state. Um, and uh, so there's a parameter theta, which is the state, state vector, or uh, system state, which consists of all voltage phase angles in all buses in the entire grid. And then each uh, local control area has its own observation model, which we can model for a DC model as a linear model, where the state is observed through the so-called Jacobian of the local connections, which just models the local topology of the electricity grid itself. So we have a linear model, linear observation model, plus noise. So then what we'd like to do is for each of, to, to use this these local observations to estimate the global state in some way. And here's uh, just very briefly an algorithm for doing that. So uh, at, at control area N, uh, we're going to estimate the, the entire state theta with an estimator Xn, 
and we'll iterate in time in the following way. At time t plus 1, we'll take the previous estimate and we'll adjust it according to two terms. The second term is a traditional incorporation of the residual. Okay, so this is the usual kind of update for an adaptive uh, estimate. Uh, and the, the other term, this term, is a consensus term. And it's not, so this term to the right incorporates the, the physics of the electricity grid through this matrix H. This term, uh, the consensus term, this is just a term trying to force the estimates to a consensus, uh, is basically a term that depends on the local communication neighborhood of the control area. So here we have the physical, uh, an update term based on the physical connections. Here we have an update term based on the cyber connections. And those two together are taken to update the estimate iterating in time. And then there are coefficients alpha and beta, which are just programmed to make this converge. And in fact, if, the, if we have global observability of the grid, that is if the, uh, which mathematically just means that the sum of the Jacobians transposed times themselves is a full rank matrix, and we have connectivity of the communication network, which just means that the, uh, well, this, this, this can be tested by looking at the so-called graph Laplacian, then we get almost sure convergence of all these local estimates to the glo a global estimate, which is least squares, based on all the al observations, assuming that we appropriately program the coefficients alpha and beta, meaning they have to go to zero, but not too fast. I realize I'm going very quickly over this, but this is basically uh, what we can do. So here's an ex some examples. These are just IEEE test bus systems. They're, they're all globally observable. Uh, all of the control areas, which are shown as these blocks, are globally unobservable. That is, none of them can estimate the global state by itself. Some of them are actually locally unobservable. That is, they can't even estimate their own state by themselves, these shaded ones. Okay. Uh, but with this algorithm, each of these areas can, uh, it, the, the, the cyber networks are shown in dotted lines. Those are all connected. So uh, because this is globally observable, we're able to apply this algorithm to estimate the global state at each one of these control areas. Okay? And you know, we know this is going to happen because we have a theorem that shows it, but this just shows for selected uh, bus angles uh, the convergence of these uh, uh, distributed estimates to the global least squares. Uh, we can also show the robustness to the communication to topology. All it has to be is connected. It doesn't matter which topology we use. And this just shows convergence for two different topologies. So again, uh, we're not showing anything that the, that the theorem doesn't, doesn't prove. Uh, here, I just mentioned a couple of other things. I just mentioned, I just showed briefly here the linear model, which is a DC model. We can also do nonlinear state estimation. Uh, we can also look at routing. Okay, routing is an important problem here where we're trying to control or stabilize the, we have we have sensors that are taking data, which has to be distributed to controllers to stabilize the the grid, uh, and uh, this is really a multicast routing problem because the sensors don't necessarily know which controllers need to have the the, uh, uh, the data that they're sensing. So there's an interesting routing problem, and you can also uh, uh, examine the same interactions between the cyber layer and the physical layer in a routing sense as well. Uh, so I think, I think with this, I, I'm way over time, which, for which I apologize. So let me just wrap up very briefly. Today I talked about three things, applying ideas from other fields, particularly wireless networks, to smart grid. I talked about some game theoretic methods for modeling interactions. I talked about uh, privacy utility trade-offs of data sources with applications in some tra trade-offs in smart grid applications. And I talked very briefly at the end about this problem of distributed state estimation, where we incorporate the novel feature of uh, two different, uh, having a dis the distribution of the data be uh, according to a different network than the uh, distribution of the state that we're trying to estimate. I think with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Shlomo, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take them. So. Sure. Yep, okay.
Yeah. Yes. The greedy algorithm is when they sell, decide to sell the maximum possible into the they, they have a, a maximum that they could sell and they decide just to sell that into the, whatever the auction price is they sell it into the, the main grid. You're not optimizing your own field. You're just you're just selling everything you've got into the. That, that, that is in a way maximizing your utility, but it's not. Uh, it's not. It's not. You're not. You're not interacting with the other players, right? When you interact with the other players, that's when you get the top line there. So. Yeah, but you know the actions of the. And when you're playing the game, you know the actions of the other players. So I didn't talk about that, but you have you, the auctioneer can actually uh, serve as a data uh, repository for what the other players are doing. So, so. yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, as I mentioned at the end, I think this is a very interesting aspect of this, looking at dynamic games in this setting, but we haven't done that. I mean, th there's an implicit, um, in this idea of energy trading, there's an implicit dynamic situation where when you charge your car at home at night, the energy is cheaper than in the daytime when you're selling it, but we're not modeling that at all. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So he, here, the, the, the sort of the, the the assumption is that you're at a stable point in time. This is happening much more rapidly than that kind of change. But you're right. I think uh, an, an interesting problem to look at in the future would be that kind of thing. That's a good point. Yeah. The, the entire state. That's right. No, no, you're right. I mean, this is a very pristine formalism. And of course, what's happening is um, something like that is happening because the connectivity of the network is allowing you to filter your estimates out into the, the network eventually. So you know, you could say, I'm only interested in the states that affect my local control area. You know, Obviously, you're getting those as a bonus from estimating the entire state. But yeah, from a practical point of view, and as I said, you know, this is really just looking at some simple models to see what can be done. I think from a practical point of view, you, you may not want to estimate the entire state of the whole North American power grid just to control New Jersey, for example. So, but, but, you know, I mean, this is a first step. So, so those are good points, though. Yeah, right there. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we, we have, I haven't looked at the situation where you have malicious uh, actors who are trying to make other people. Yeah, yeah, th there are, there, actually there, there has been a lot of work in this kind of problem, not necessarily using game theory as much as using uh, other kinds of things, but one of the problems that a lot of pe people look at are so-called bad data problems. So the last problem where you're trying to estimate the state, uh, you know, bad actors can inject bad data in, into the network through this through the sensors, can compromise the sensors. There's a lot of work on how, how many sensors do you need to secure to be sure that you can get accurate state estimates and things like that. But that, th that's a big issue. I mean, with terrorism and things like that, that's a big concern. So, yeah, so. Oh, hi, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I talk too slow.
Um, well, in this one, my background in est detection and estimation <laughs> comes into play. But I mean, the uniqueness, I think, is it, it may not be unique to this problem, but it's unique, I think, to cyber physical systems, where the state is a state of a, a physical system, but the connections are uh, uh, through a different network. So the, the, the uniqueness or the interesting part of this is that uh, the, the, connections are, are the, the connections are not the same connections. That is, we're trying to estimate one network based on connections through another network. So I don't know if that, that makes sense. It, it, another, you know, another example might be a social network where you have social connections, but the observations you make maybe are through Facebook or something like that. So you might be trying to decide what's happening in the real so society based on measurements that come through a cyber. R r right, right. So I, I think that it's, it's not unique to power grids, but it is unique to sort of this cyber physical situation where you have two different networks interacting. So that's a good, good question, though. So, OK. Thank you, and, and thank you for your patience. I'm sorry to go over a little bit. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Avi Osprey. I'm coming from civil and domestic engineering. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not from electrical engineering. Uh -huh. But I'm doing water distribution systems. Uh -huh. uh, water distribution. 